thank you for the introduction. So um, I'm going to talk about regularized SAMIS networks for uh, anomaly detection on brain MRI images uh, with an application to epilepsy lesion detection. So what we're doing here is that we're developing computer-aided diagnosis systems. Such systems um, receive a team with several, uh, a single or multiple modalities of imaging data perform model training and then output probabilistic maps or um, sign score maps depending on the task. We have already established that there is a, a lack of accurately labeled data in this domain, uh, but we can also state that there is relatively many more um, MR screenings belonging to healthy individuals that do not carry any pathology. On the other hand, we have a number of brain, brain pathologies that are ca characterized by very subtle lesions. Now, in this case, it, it is not only difficult and time-consuming to um, uh, contour these lesions, but it is also sometimes impossible um, following a visual exam alone. In this case, we call the patients MRI-negative patients. For such patients, the uh, MRI scans look completely normal. It is therefore our challenge to adopt unsupervised learning methods to leverage the best we can from the uh, scars, scans belonging to healthy individuals. Now I give you three uh, examples of epilepsy patients. Can you see any lesion in here? Sometimes experts don't either. So in the uh, case in the middle, for the patient in the middle, it was quite easy more or less to detect the lesion, which is quite subtle here. But for these two cases, uh, the lesions were missed during a typical visual analysis by an expert. So we're going to focus on this kind of anomalies, uh, lesions. Now, when it comes to epilepsy, the current, um, the current state of the art methods are developed in various settings. For instance, some of them use supervised settings, but more recently, semi supervised and completely unsupervised, such as anomaly detection methods, have been developed. The main disadvantage that we see in the current uh, proposed method is that, first of all, they tackle a particular a single cause of epilepsy, which is usually cortical, uh, focal cortical dysplasia. But it's not the only cause. And uh, since they tackle this, this cause, uh, the features that they are using are limited to the clinical knowledge for, the, for this, particular, norm, for this particular, particular type of epilepsy. Now, what we want to do is to move away and extend the range of features considered for epilepsy lesion detection task. And uh, this is why we're going to be trying to do that and learn features in an automatic way. Now, we have seen great examples of supervised, um, of supervised models based on deep learning, for, especially in particular for tumor segmentation. But for this, as we have already stated, we need a lot of labeled data. We can, of course, move towards weekly uh, super... Sorry. We can, of course, move to weekly supervision, but in this case as well, we will still need some level of supervision. And uh, in the medical domain, there are not many um, works uh, dedicated to the unsupervised uh, context. And this is what we want to do. So our task here in this work was to, first of all, cast the subtle brain lesion detection task as, an, as a voxel level anomaly, anomaly detection task. So to this end, what we do is that we register the scans belonging to healthy individuals all to the same template, which means they will have the same dimensionality. And then for each voxel here, for each voxel in the brain volume, we're going to build a one-class SVM model representing its normality. Then when we have a patient, for each of the voxel, we're going to match it to the corresponding one-class SVM model, and then we're going to assign a score to this voxel. In this way, we will, have a, we will obtain a, score, a signed score map. Now, in the remaining of this talk, I will focus on this part. So what are the features that we can use to uh, train these one-class SVM models on? And to this end, we're going to use Siamese networks. So a Siamese network is a framework that receives a team put two images and a label uh, standing for either similarity or dissimilarity of, of the pair. It consists of two identically parameterized subnetworks, which perform the mapping from uh, the original input space to space, where um, the similar pace, pairs are mapped close to each other, and when they are dissimilar, they are, they are mapped uh, far apart. And this is controlled through a cost module, which consists of two terms, respectively for the similar pairs and dissimilar pairs. 
Now, uh, you can see how it translates to our context because we have healthy patients. We can call them similar, but we don't have dissimilar pairs. So here is what we propose. First of all, the input for our regular Samis network will consist in the patches centered at the same voxel in the brain volume. We will call those patches similar. And we propose to use text convolutional autoencoders as subnetworks to perform the mapping from the input patch space to a space, which is called it here as JX. And then we will decode it to, to have a reconstructed patch. Now, our objective here is to, ma is to map the um, patches that come from the same brain localization to close representations. It is therefore that we will use cosine similarity between the representations JX1 and JX in the loss term. But this term alone does, is not enough, so we cannot use it um, by itself. So we add a regularizer, which stands for the reconstruction error of each of the subnetworks. What does this mean? Basically, we're searching for a representation space where healthy patches are mapped close to each other, but also they carry some meaning, at least, uh, in terms of the reconstruction error of the subnetworks. Now, the representation JX here will be used to train one class SVM models for each voxel. Um, so the data set we considered consists of 75 um, healthy patients, T1 and flare acquisitions, and 21 um, patients with confirmed epilepsy lesions. Out of those, 18 are MR negatives, which means those patients were, have not been, uh, uh, those lesions have not been uh, de detected uh, visually over a visual analysis by an expert. Um, the subnetwork architecture we consider is actually quite simple. You can see it consists only of three um, convolutional layers and around the same number of deconvolutional layers. And uh, we experimented a, a bit with the alpha trade-off coefficient. We grew it linearly from 0 to 0.5. And the whole net network was trained on around 3.5 million patches of size uh, 15 by 15. So now let's see what it gives us. Given an input image of a patient, in this case it's, um, it's an MRI positive patient, in this case it's an MRI negative patient, the output of the CAD system will look like this. So the darker colors indicate more negative values. The more negative values stand for the more suspiciousness of the current uh, region. So you can see this region have been considered quite negative for th by the model. Now, uh, by thresholding this map, we can obtain, uh, we can control the number of clusters we have uh, after some post-processing steps. So in this case, we can see here the cluster here, which grows once we, ch we change the threshold. Same happens for the MRI negative case, but then you can see the difference in the number of clusters. So what we do usually is that we keep at most, we say we keep, we're gonna keep at most 15 clusters, and then we rank those clusters according to their sizes and the average score of the voxels in those clusters which gives us a um, um, uh, sort of mapping that uh, gives preference to the big clusters that carry uh, the most negative scores. And then what we do is that we count in uh, the percentage of through detections among the top N clusters. Let's say so in this uh, figure here, we can say that among the top three clusters in around 38% of cases, we have detected the lesions. And if we move, if we consider top 10 clusters, we can see that we detect in around 62% uh, uh, of cases, we detect the epilepsy lesions. Um, the other message from this plot is that if you consider single uh, modalities such as the T1 and flare separately, you will have less, um, you will have a way worse performance than if you consider them um, together, uh, combined as channels for the input, uh, for the network training, which is quite consistent with the literature. Okay, so now let's look cl more closely to the kind of outputs we usually have. The first column corresponds to a positive patient, as I've already shown you. And you can see that the first, the uh, topmost uh, ranked uh, cluster has quite a good detection of it, um, which can be explained by the fact that there is a visual biomarker of the presence of the lesion. It's not the same thing if we consider MRI negative patients. So for these patients, we have already found, we have also found other clusters which looked on uh, more or less as suspicious as this one. That's because there is no visual biomarker that would tell us, okay, this one is more, neg more uh, anomalous than the rest. And same ha happens here. We have two more clusters which were considered more or less as, um, as anomalous as the real one, which you can see here, the ground fruit in red circles. 
So as for the quantitative analysis, one thing you should uh, remember from these uh, performance measures is that humans are not very good at this task. Uh, they managed to detect only three out of 21 lesions. And if we move towards automatic CAT systems, we can have at most 13 detections out of 21 if we consider both T1 and flare modalities together. Now, what is quite a um, popular choice in the community of brain uh, image analysis is the software called SPM. And uh, we perform this SPM analysis, which consists basically in normally detection by using uh, statistical methods on uh, two clinically um, correlated feature, on two clinical features correlated to, um, to some sort of epilepsy. So when we did perform this analysis with the same ranking method, we obtained more or less, or actually less performance results except for the case of extension. But then you see that when you combine these uh, different features, the result actually gets worse, which is why which, which is where we see the advantage of using this kind of uh, approaches, because then we can um, extend the feature space uh, by considering different modalities and the performance gets better. So to conclude, I've presented you a regularized SAMIS network for um, feature from a supervised feature learning that can be trained entirely on the scans of healthy individuals. Um, basically, this approach can be applicable to, to any brain pathology with subtle lesions, and it achieves around 62% sensitivity for nine false positives on the task of epilepsy detection. Um, now, we're planning to uh, come up with an interface for this, and uh, it can be easily integrated into clinical practice to have some feedback from, um, from the experts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the great talk. Are there any questions from the audience? I can start off with a first question. Um, how is the registration accuracy affecting the performance of your methods? It's a very uh, common question we have been asked. Um, so uh, when I was working on the um, T1 modality, I have tried two uh, methods implemented in the SPM software, two registration methods, and the performance were almost identical. So uh, in my view, it does not affect a lot. And also, there is one thing that I skipped in my presentation. So when we have this output, when we, get the, when we have this sign score map, we actually um, also estimate a standard deviation map per voxel, which basically says, OK, for this region, region, probably the output score maps vary more than for the other regions. And then we scale the output maps for the patients by uh, dividing it over the standard deviation. In my view, if there are mistakes, in, if there are errors in the registration, it also alleviates in the process of post-processing. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> Sorry, just a follow-up on that. Um, what type of registration did you say you used? Uh, it's the UNISEG algorithm implemented in SPM. And the other one was Dartel. So it's nonlinear registration. Yes. Okay. So did you ever evaluate the effect of using a network rather than, for example, a PCA like they did uh, maybe five years ago? Uh, if, I like if I just would extract features with PCA yeah. instead of this one? OK, so um, I didn't use PCA, but I did uh, compare these features with um, like this red curve here shows the, um, the performance of the network obtained by using one of the sub-networks of the Siamese network, which is basically a convolutional author encoder. And uh, this is the results we have with Siamese network. So my first uh, comparison was to see if the, um, the Siamese network adds anything to the stacked convolutional author and, uh, autoencoder, and basically it does. And the other curves here you see is Wasserstein autoencoder, which I added recently. So sorry for the sloppy. Uh, plot. Any further questions? <coughs> yes, over there. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I might have missed, but uh, uh, in the patient group, you said that there are 18 MR negative patients. Right. And how can you uh, in, in that case, how can you determine that there, how can you determine the ground truth in, in those Okay, patients? that's a very good question. Okay, so the ground truth is because all these patients, they have been operated on 
and so uh, some part of the, the, the brain was removed, and then they were seizure-free afterwards. So this gives us medical evidence that there, there was actually an anomaly, there was an epilepsy lesion uh, in that zone. And this is what we do. We take the post-op uh, scans and we try to do our best to delineate the zone with the experts. This is how we got the ground fruit. Okay, so the operation was uh, based on the this study not, not this results. Usually what happens is that they perform also EEG exam, which is they implant electrodes in the brain to see if there's an activation, which is an invasive method, and this is why we move toward, we try to move towards um, imaging to obtain the same information from the imaging. But yeah, this exam gives a more complete picture of where the uh, expert should attack the lesion, which part of the zone, which zone should be removed during the resection. Okay, thanks. Very small question here. Um, you mentioned that you use 15 times 15 uh, pixel right. uh, patches. Um, do you think this is always enough, or would you benefit from maybe larger receptive fields? Uh, I have tried uh, the size 27 or 30 something. It never detected anything, actually, except for the easy cases. So my explanation was that it's, it's a very local type of anomaly, epilepsy. So it, it really depends on very local features we can obtain. So for me, all the tests I've done, above um, the patch size 18 were all unsuccessful. And that's the only explanation I can give. Unless we downscale maybe the 30-30 uh, the patch, and I don't know. Maybe a different approach would be more beneficial, but just taking the, the a bigger patch did not, did not yield good performance. Okay, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank, thank the speaker you. again.